Amen. I want to challenge you crazy people that went out last night and stayed out late to a Christian concert. <laughs> Stay awake this morning. It was good. Yes, it was. Stay awake. Now, I, I know those guys are awesome. They really are. One of the few premier Christian groups that has stayed true to the message of the gospel. They've not changed that message since the day. And a lot of groups do change. They get to that alternative stuff, and, and they have not. So that is awesome. All right, let's get into work today. That 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> I should have marked my paper sticking together. There we go. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. No. I wrote that down on 2 Timothy. <laughs> I knew that was a typo. That just didn't look right. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. There we go. There we go. Thank God this is not a computer. I've been lost this time. That's good. That's good. Okay, first, or 2 Timothy. I've got to change that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. <laughs> But men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people to turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gold the women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. I know I read verse 9, but that's not one of my typos. Father in heaven, today we, we thank you for your love, your mercy, for your word, God, that we know is true. We thank you for these here 66 Bible books of the Bible that is called the Holy Scriptures, knowing God that we can count on them. Father God, knowing that it is your divine word given to us. And I pray today, God, that we as your people would learn to seek you out. To ask for the right way. For the old, ancient, improved way. And to knock on the door of truth. So that we will know. And we will be a free people. In the name of Yeshua, your Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to deal with the topic, the title of this message called Religion and the Church. Religion and the Church. That sound like fun? We're going to confront the, uh, the church goer today. <coughs> Who's the church goer? Us. You. Me. Hey. All right. We're Christian people, yes. We're believers, yes. But we do attend church. Obviously, you're here. Okay? Let's get that one out of the way. We are church goers. All right? We are going to confront or be confronted with the true reason God created church. Why do you think there is a church today? Why do you think we attend church on Sunday morning. What's the purpose of it? Do we need it? Those kind of questions we'll be dealing with. Hopefully we'll have some understanding. Hopefully you have brought your rake to church, as my grandma used to say. Rake in the Word of God for ourselves. We're also going to talk about how God 
has ordained and, and made this place of worship that when we attend, when we go to church, for no other reason but to worship God. I know we might get a big amen on that one. We might say, yes, brother, that's where we come to church to worship God. Well, let's take an honest look and hopefully we'll come to that conclusion. That is why we come to church. But for many people, that's not the only reason. We also, as we hear the word, as it is implanted in our hearts, <coughs> the Bible tells us when we receive his word, receive the truth, have that understanding, receive him in our heart, that word is implanted into us. A lot of the problem begins, or the controversy in our life begins right here when we hear the word, and then we struggle with obedience. We hear the word, and instead of saying like Abraham, when God called out to him and he said, Here I am, Lord. Or when he called out to Isaiah and he said, here I am. You see, there's no controversy there. When God calls out to us and we say, here I am. And you think, well, I do that all the time. I do that some of the time. Or I never do that. You ever been to those tests for answer this question? All the time, part of the time, some of the time. So you know where I'm going with this. Controversy in our mind and in our heart and our life begins when we hear the word and we do not obey it. Then here's the next thing we do. In order for us to take the pressure or the magnifying glass off of us, when we know God is looking at us, you ever been there? You ever felt that? That you just felt like the preacher was talking to you specifically. Or you felt like whatever it was that you heard, you felt like that God had that big eyeglass right on you and he was dealing with you right then and there. And you're like, I don't know what to do. <coughs> we have a tendency, instead of allowing God to deal with us, on an individual basis and say, okay, Lord, what is in my life that needs to be fixed? What is in my life that needs to be corrected? We have this tendency of looking around. Then we start looking around at others and saying, well, they're like me or they're as bad as me or they, you might even say, well, they're worse than I am. Their sins are worse than mine. You see, they have these bad habits that I don't have. They do this that I don't do. And we look around at other people when we know that only way we're going to get peace is when we start obeying <coughs> God and listening to Him on our own without looking around and trying to find excuses why you don't obey God. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Am I striking a nerve with some of you? Do I have some confirmation here? Because, you see, this is what goes on in the believer's life. And believe me, when I say this, it happens to all of us, including me. Okay? So as you hear this message, understand something. It is not coming from the pulpit of a condescending nose looking down at you all. It is talking to you from my heart and understanding that we all deal with this. And if we do church the way we're supposed to do church, peace comes, healing comes, deliverance comes, things happen in our life. We do things differently than we ever have before. The question is, will we be like Abraham and Isaiah and many of others we've read about? Whenever God calls out to us and we say, here I am, Lord. Or will we be Adam, the first Adam, when he was in the garden and God came through in the cool of the day as he always did. And he said, Adam, where art thou? Where are you, Adam? And Adam was hiding. Are we going to hide from God as if we could? Think about those questions. Think about that topic. Now, here's a big question. Why are there so many today that refuse to attend church? 
Why are there so many people that refuse to attend church? Just throw a, cut, a number at you. I think last year there was, in Wayne County alone, I, I think our numbers have went down. There, uh, about 10 years ago, we had about 18,000 people in Wayne County. I think that was just people that could vote. Today, I think, uh, I heard not too long ago that we have about 15,000 now in Wayne County. Let me ask you this question. You look at us and our average number around in this church is around 100, 110 sometimes. Last week is a little more. We had some visitors. And you just look at an average church in town that is running around 150, 250. Probably it would be 250 would be a pretty far stretch for a, a, a church in town that on an everyday attendance. And I'm not talking about just members. I've seen churches that's got membership boards, had 450 on the membership, but 160 came this morning. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Now we've got some churches out in the rural areas that we have some churches that have bigger numbers, but most of your rural churches are average 30 to 40 people. And you start adding those numbers up, and I, I, I just, just at the churches that I knew, and just kind of taking a high average of 50 in the, in the country churches, which I believe is a very high average, I came up with about 5,000, and I think that was the most. I think that was putting in church numbers at the max in Wayne County. So we have about 10,000 people in Wayne County alone, and we're a small population county in comparison to something like if you go out to St. Clair County where there's way, way, way more than 15,000 people. You go to South County and you're looking up there a lot bigger numbers. Just in Wayne County alone, there's, I'm going to say at the smallest number, 10,000 people that do not attend church on a regular basis. Oh, here we go. The pastor's trying to get the numbers up. He's going to give us this big spill of how we can get our church numbers up. That's what it's all about. No, it's not. That actually is the last thing I'm seeking. Believe me, I love it when people come to church. I love to see the church grow as we all do. We all talk about it. We love to see the potential here in, in our younger people and some of the programs that's going on. We love to see all that. I'll be honest with you, that's, that's cool. But this is not about getting the church numbers up. Oh, yeah, they should.